Welcome, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, Gastro Echo uh, meeting. Our topic uh, is the liver through different lenses, and the lenses in question here would be those of Professor Martin Hale, who I'd like to welcome, as well as Dr. Charles Sanika, an interventional radiologist and someone who um, is very much part of our multidisciplinary liver um, management team at Donald Gordon, uh, whose expertise we rely on uh, tremendously. So um, as, uh, I think the second case that I uh, will be presenting today underlines um, uh, his, 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 his value uh, to our team and treatment of our patients. Um, so I think we, what we're going to do is that we're going to get straight into it. The first patient is not, funnily enough, not a pure liver patient. He is a young gentleman, 32 years old, who had um, uh, a allo cell, uh, cell uh, transplant, that's bone marrow uh, transplant for, uh, for, for a leukemia um, in August. Of, of this year. He's had quite a complicated course with initial graft versus host disease um, as, as, well as, as well as further, further pathologies. Um, he was immune, uh, quite significantly immune suppressed um, when uh, one evening, and, and uh, we, we had, as the uh, GI liver team, gotten accustomed, accustomed to uh, managing him uh, from a graft versus host perspective, at the same time worried about other infective etiologies such as CMV, uh, when he, he, he went off quite considerably on a particular evening. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sanyika to take us through the uh, CT images um, of, of that particular evening. Um, over to you, Charles. Uh, thanks, Bilal. Uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me to be part of uh, this uh, meeting. I'll try and screen share. Everybody seeing my images? Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. So this is a contrasted CT study of the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, we see that there's contrast by the uh, opacification of the vascular channels and the heart chambers here. So this is a post-contrast study. Um, when we scroll past the liver, we're going to see contrast in the hepatic veins, in the IVC, abdominal aorta, and lower down, we'll see the portal vein. All right. And uh, this is a patient who had uh, uh, either been diagnosed, I think previously diagnosed with uh, graft uh, versus host disease, predominantly affecting the small bowel, and uh, it previously been shown to have this diffusely infiltrating and enhancing segments of small bowel. I'll just maybe just go mention that in passing. Uh, so this is remnants of uh, what used to be much more extensive. Uh, it was more widespread, much thicker, and um, uh, from that perspective, the patient seemed to be getting better. However, there were newer findings on these current scans, which were worrying, especially with this acute presentation, in that I'll use uh, the right half of this image to illustrate the findings, where we're seeing, for example, in the mid abdomen here, the air is black, fluid is somewhere in between muscle density and air, so that's fluid within the lumen, that's transverse colon probably. So there's a air, small air fluid level in the transverse colon here. Luminal air will always be non-dependent. And in this particular patient, if we con uh, in contradiction to what we're seeing here, if we look in this segment of colon here, there's luminal fluid. There is indeed luminal air, again, where there's an interface of air and fluid, there will be an air fluid level, right? In addition, there's uh, some of which are linear, some of which are nodular, air lucences outlining the contour of the bowel, in some instances, in a non-dependent aspect. So if this was luminal in this aspect, it would have floated up to here. 
this is confirming to us this is the extra luminal air. But because it's going along the uh, outlines of the bow, this is not free intraperitoneal air, but mural air. So this is intramural air within, for in this uh, slice here, within the right colon. So there might be a bit of trans, uh, right half of the transverse colon. This might be uh, ascending um, uh, colon. So there is indeed extensive air, mural air, in addition to the normal luminal gas we see. So it's not only in the ascending colon, we also saw other bits of colon going to the left iliac fossa region. There's again this linear non dependent air lucences. In this particular situation, there is also associated thickening of the bowel wall. So this is a thickened segment of part of sigmoid or uh, descending colon. Again, similar to the right side, there is mural air. And I think lastly, with the bits lower down, even in the rectum, similar appearance. So that's pneumatosis of the bowel, interest analysis of the bowel, which is a non-specific sign on its own. Once the air is going into the bowel walls like this, it can transgress into the portal venous system. So occasionally we see air bubbles sitting in the portal venous system, like in this beer mesenteric vein, uh, splenic vein, uh, portal vein itself, and eventually it gets into the divisions of the portal vein within the liver. In this particular patient, all the small air lucences we see are actually projected over the liver. And you can see these small little lucences, some of which are, can make out to be linear. And a lot of it is extending all the way to the immediate subcapsular region of the liver. I mentioned this uh, sign because it's quite important. The one other reason we commonly find air projected over the liver is because of pneumobilia. That's air within the bowel, I mean, with the bowel ducts. Common finding following an ERCVP, sphincterotomy, and such interventions. With biliary air or pneumobilia, the, the air uh, over the liver will tend to be central and maybe into some of the central non dependent ducts. So you find it in the region of the common bowel duct, which runs along the main portal vein here, and occasionally you find it in the central left intrahepatic bowel ducts in a patient who's lying supine. You never get bits of biliary air going this peripheral. So that's typical of portal venous gas, which is spread peripherally. A sign also we can see um, occasionally with um, uh, outer and outer sound. So in essence, this patient has got pneumatosis intestinalis with some gas uh, perfusing through into the portal venous system. Pneumatosis intestinalis can be caused by a variety of reasons. Um, the factors that come into play to almost infuse air into the bowel is intraluminal pressure, the somehow loss of integrity of the lining of the bowel, be it by ulceration, be it by traumat for traumatic reasons, be it by infection, and occasionally whether there's bowel, I mean, gas forming organisms involved in the infection. And not all pneumatosis intestinalis is equal to life-threatening conditions. We can occasionally find this in patients who are completely asymptomatic with very benign abdomens clinically. Uh, case in point, patients who have had recent scopes with uh, in, intraluminal infusion of, of, of air, not that we image them frequently, but occasionally if you were to uh, do an X-ray, for example, we can, might see some pneumobilia on it, not pneumobilia, rather uh, air within the uh, portal of venous system, and yet uh, their tummies are completely benign. The more worrying uh, conditions that we, uh, we think of when we see this, and we want to make sure that not, it's, it's not the case, is um, uh, ischemic bowel. And with that, what we look for is associated 
reduction or loss of uh, perfusion of the bowel loops. Just to look on the left side of this bowel, of, of this uh, scan, you can see the white edge of the wall of the bowel, which is normal bowel perfusion, and that's normal colonic wall. And on the right hand side, one is worried about possible ischemia because we have a thickened wall and not so much perfusion uh, when you compare to that left side. So this is worrisome for ischemic bowel. And um, the, the other conditions as infection, colitis, uh, viral or bacterial infections uh, uh, need not necessarily have reduction in bowel wall enhancement. Uh, in this patient, we had that there was a possibility of having a, a viral colitis. And um, we know that is immunocompromised uh, and which predisposes to infective etiologies of this condition. So it's an important sign to be able to pick up because sometimes a patient who's presenting with an acute abdomen with no real uh, known uh, etiology, they might have other uh, suggestions on the scan that they might have uh, peripheral vascular disease in the background, you know, extensively calcified iota and, and osteostenosis of the SMA. You might sometimes even see embolic uh, filling defects in the arterial influent of the bowel, which you can pick up when we have this exquisite contrast enhancement, and then you can make a call uh, then of definite uh, bowel ischemia. But in this patient, the differential diagnosis is quite wide uh, as to what the etiology of the pneumatosis is. But what the worrying thing is, the reduced perfusion on the right side and the relative acute presentation. And then to, uh, just to, uh, to, uh, on our way out, just to show that the graft versus was the involvement of the small bowel, uh, when compared to the previous scans, was apparently getting better. So I'll hand over to are uh, you uh, below? Yeah, so so what had happened here is that he'd actually, you know, with management of his graft versus host disease, he'd actually picked up um, CMV and 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 uh, you know we we didn't actually go in and biopsy um, uh, the colon because we 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 were worried about uh, actually even um, uh, an infarcted segment. Um, that was our, our clinical suspicion. Um, we took him down and uh, had a defunctioned uh, ileostomy um, when the, the, the surgeon felt that the colon still looked viable. Um, and, and somewhat after that took, took further biopsies, which we then passed on to Professor Hale. Prof, I see you've got your hand up. Thanks, Bilal. So it's Martin Hale here speaking. So, Charles, thanks. It's a wonderful demonstration uh, of the uh, of the pneumatosis uh, in the bowel. I, I, I miss the the differential diagnosis. You said that the important differential diagnosis uh, is pneumobilia, um, and I didn't quite catch how you separate the two. Sorry, um, the um, I brought up pneumobilia when we're talking about portal venous gas versus pneumobilia projected over the liver. So that, that, that's where pneumobilia came up. It's, oh, not, so a, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a differential of pneumatosis intestinalis. So it's, um, but in the liver, uh, yeah. you said it, it, it's hemobilia, not pneumobilia. It's pneumobilia. When you've got air within the bowel, yeah. okay. as opposed to air in the portal vein. Right. So, so how, how do you separate those two out then, radiologically? Okay. All right. I'll go back onto the image here. The portal venous gas tends to be um, taken by the floor to the periphery of the liver. So you see these streaks of air going more peripheral, some of them even right under the liver capsule here. Yeah. And with the hemobilia, uh, uh, the air tends to be more central. Remember, it's going against the floor of the bile, as it were. <laughs> it tends to be more central, and you sometimes see it even going into the common bile duct. So it's the peripheral gas with portal venous gas as opposed to central gas with uh, new mobilia. That's fascinating. Thanks, thanks, Charles. I mean, I, I can't recall I've ever seen a case of uh, of um, air in the in the liver at all. I don't know if anybody else is. I see Ellen is on the 
on the meeting as well. I don't know if, if you've seen it, Ellen. Prof, I think we, re we, we regularly see it as a part of a radiological finding, um, especially as, as, as Charles has, has pointed out when a you know, patient is post DRCP or um, PTC, sphincterotomy, that sort of thing. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it necessarily translates to a histological um, positive finding. Sure, I've never seen it. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Okay, I, I must I must tell you a story uh, of a post liver transplant patient. As you probably are aware, we almost routinely do uh, Doppler studies and ultrasounds to check on the perfusion of the graft uh, within 24 hours, 24 hours later, 48 hours, and then depending on their uh, clinical progress, we spread it out. There was this particular patient. I think it was day day one. And um, he had this fascinating white appearance of the portal veins, and uh, which is obviously a, a, a portal venous gas. And interestingly, he tells us he had had a, a fizzy drink. He had a fizzy drink next to his, to his bed. And what we then did is we waited a couple hours, came back, and it was gone. Hmm. Sure. So, so hey, the moral Prof, of the story is don't, don't have a Coke before you go for a scan. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Prof, can I ask you to uh, show, show, go on to the histology on this uh, fascinating gentleman? Yes. So I'm going to start off. Uh, thanks, Bilal, and thanks to the ECHO team and the Gastro Foundation for asking me to, to show you these, uh, these two interesting cases. So, um, I uh, really could not resist uh, showing you both biopsies on this particular patient. Um, so the first, uh, the first patient, at least the first biopsy, um, was undertaken in the middle of October. I think it was about the 10th or the 12th of October. And uh, this is when uh, we diagnosed the graft versus host disease. And it really is a classic example of this entity. And uh, here you can see we've got... Um, uh, portions of uh, of bowel, and uh, we have this is actually the sigmoid colon, believe it or not. Um, and then what we have are these uh, crypts. You can see that the architecture is is um, is completely um, distorted. We've got extensive loss of of uh, of intestinal crypts. And then when we look, have a closer look at, uh, at the actual crypt epithelium, we have this uh, classic appearance of what's called the exploding crypts. And um, you can see sorry. that. So, 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 sorry, Martin, sorry to interrupt. This, yeah. this is the initial diagnosis of the graft versus host from the sigmoid colon, correct? That's right, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, yeah, I couldn't resist showing you this because, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's the same patient. and. And yeah. really just, as you can see, these exploding crypts. I mean, you couldn't mm -hmm. actually, this is a textbook example of graft versus host disease and uh, really is florid. And you can see uh, all these um, epithelial cells, which are hence the name, the exploding crypt. And uh, that's, uh, that's the example there. You can see you've got all this karyorectic debris uh, in the epithelial cells. In other areas, uh, it's... Um, so, for example, there you can see the same sort of thing happening there. You can see all this uh, necrotic and karyorectic debris. So that's a classic example then of graft versus uh, host disease. And in fact, there is another crypt there uh, where you can see, uh, for example, a whole row of epithelial cells that are being destroyed by the graft versus host disease. So that's a, a classic textbook appearance then of GVH. And in fact, I was just wondering, I wonder if that is ever a cause of, uh, of um, pneumatosis intestinalis in its an advanced uh, case, because it was only two weeks between the two biopsy. This then is yeah. the second biopsy. Yeah, sorry, Martin. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Uh, it is listed as a potential cause. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they, they put it under transplant patients and graft versus wasp can be associated. It's, it's one of them. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me in view of the extensive intestinal injury that, that is present. So then this is the, the next biopsy, which was 
uh, down at the beginning of November. And uh, one can see also we've got um, uh, we've got large bowel uh, mucosa and also small bowel mucosa. I think this is, I can't remember the precise site of this, but certainly we've got goblet cells here. I think, I this, think this I think this was ileum, Prof. Was it ileum? Yeah, it might have been ileum. So here we've got um, uh, you can see goblet cells and the, and the uh, bullous appearance of the of the small bowel, and then uh, in the underlying submucosa, uh, one can see that uh, you've got um, uh, this extensive edema of the lamina propria. Once again, that the architecture has been uh, obliterated. I think some of this might um, it might be ileo sequel. Um, yes, because um, I think some of these might also be be large bile crypts, and I think we're probably at the ileo sequel junction. And then uh, in the lamina propria, um, we can see that, for example, here that there's a complete uh, architectural change to the epithelium, lots of flattening. And then here we've got a, a cell uh, which is showing the classic appearance of, uh, of um, cytomegalovirus infection. You can see that we've got prominent nucleolus and we've got um, the margination uh, of the chromatin towards the periphery. And then there's some more. And then just to show you before I leave this, uh, how we have to separate this out, for example, from, say, if I just ask you to take a photograph in your mind of a CMV infected cell such as that there and compare it uh, to this cell here. That cell there, and that's a ganglion cell. So these are always the differentials. Is this CMV or is it a ganglion cell? And then elsewhere in the biopsy, lots of fibrinopurulent debris. Um, we won't worry too much about this. This is a, a sequestrant, uh, I think, in the in the material. Um, but here, beneath the epithelium and the mucosal epithelium, you can see large numbers of virally infected stromal cells. And these are present, I think, in endothelial cells and also in the mesenchymal cells uh, of the lamina propria. And we've got both cytom, you can see the, uh, the intranuclear and the intracytoplasmic inclusions, and many of these cells are infected by CMV. So it's got a florid CMV infection uh, to boot. And then this is the immunohistochemistry. And I might add that CMV was done on the initial graft versus host disease, and that was negative. Find these biopsies. <laughs> And there's the same area. Uh, and here you can see the positively staining uh, antibody for cytomegalovirus. And that cell there you see, I think uh, maybe not quite, but the lighter staining peripheral rim is the cytoplasmic staining. Um, and uh, the central dark staining is the nucleus. Yeah, you can't quite see that. That's the lighter staining cytoplasm there in the nucleus in the center. So a very good example then of CMV enteritis uh, consequent to immunosuppression. So two, uh, two good pathologies. Good case. Thanks, Palau. Thanks so much, guys. Um, yeah, uh, that, uh, that, that truly was fascinating. Um, I think we're going to be moving on to our next case then, uh, who is 66 year old gentleman. Um, interestingly, he is uh, from uh, originally from Turkey, had significant loss of weight, um, early satiety, and a CT scan was done um, at. Uh, uh, a facility that I think certainly uses a, a, a lower slice 
count than, than ours here, um, where they suggested that it might be an FNH uh, lesion. Um, it doesn't look like the alpha feta protein is, is recorded here, um, uh, but uh, a liver biopsy was performed on this gentleman that came back, came back as a um, HCC. Uh, he was referred to our team for further management um, and, and um, uh, for, for, for further management and, and treatment consideration. Um, Charles, I will hand over to you to take us through the imaging that you have. Charles? Okay, so I'm just having a meeting oh. myself. Right, okay. All right, okay. <laughs> uh, and then I need to share my screen, or do you share a screen? You got my images there now? Everybody seeing them? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So this is the CT scan of the gentleman, and um, what we have here side by side are different phases of um, post-contrast CT scans. On the left, it's like a late arterial phase, and on the right is like a portal venous phase. And I'll try and sync them a little bit more like that, and we can move them together. All right. All right, so, so this gentleman has got quite an impressive um, mass in, involving the left lobe predominantly. I'll just go to a slice where it was the best. So there's this huge mass here, which is a lobulated irregular outline. It's quite arterialized because all these, what we are seeing here, are small arterial branches. Like I said, this is in the early, late arterial phase. This is a mostly arterial um, supply to the tumor. And, um, you know, we talk about a typical um, arterialization with venous washout for HCC as being diagnostic for an HCC. When it comes to such huge muscles, uh, unfortunately, you have to uh, take that with a pinch of salt. Sometimes, like in this particular patient, there may be huge necrotic areas centrally. And uh, um, the flow dynamics may not necessarily be the same. They also tend to get a lot of, uh, which, which is why, in fact, we get this washout. They get a lot of arterial venous shunting in these abnormal tumor vessels. So if you're looking at, uh, say, this section, you say, okay, there's lots of arterial inflow, and it's somewhat is going a bit grayer there. So that's, that's the element of washout that we talk about. So maybe not um, so obvious one here, and we, we tend to see it with slightly smaller tumors. There's a more cranial component to uh, uh, the lesion, and maybe t is even better, in that that solid nubbin is quite bright on the arterial face and gets somewhat gray and darker. So that's what we talk about. That's when we talk about the uh, venous washout. This is now a venous phase scan. We are seeing hepatic veins and portal veins. And this was mostly arterial scan. So it was arterialized and there was some washout. And also overlying where the growth is, you can see that there's a reaction in the uh, overlying mesentery and moment, uh, momentum, I think with some vascularity on it, uh, not infrequent in this peripheral growth that um, they parasitize arterial inflow from the momentum. So uh, this might be momentum, which is adherent to part of this tumor and some of its arterial inflow goes into the tumor. Important things that we look out for, I mean, we obviously look at the sizes because we're now transplanting uh, patient for malignancies is obviously out of, of the criteria that's, that's that, that required, which I want to hopefully most of the people on the platform here. We generally want to uh, transplant a small limited disease in a nutshell. <laughs> there is different um, uh, uh, systems used, uh, the Milan criteria being the most widely used, where you don't want to transplant anybody with more than three lesions, the largest of which is more than three centimeters. So size is important. The next thing is we want to assess for 
uh, macrovascular inversion. And by macrovascular inversion, this is what we can pick up on imaging, is looking at the portal veins and systemic veins, the hepatic veins. In this patient, uh, I mean the, the lower segment 4B portal vein, I mean, impossible to uh, interrogate because this mass has basically replaced that part of the liver. But otherwise, the central main portal vein, dividing to left and right here, are not infiltrated by tumor. There might be some splaying or mass effect remotely from where this tumor is, but the portal vein is not invaded. The other thing we look for is to see whether there might be portahepatitis lymphadenopathy, which might well be metastatic. In this particular patient, these small little nodes which are really uh, non-diagnostic. And uh, it's not infrequent, especially when you start seeing these adherent uh, omentum, that sometimes these hepatomas which are peripheral can rupture and you can get extensive peritoneal seeding of tumor. So you also look out for uh, whether there's uh, ascites, which is uh, hemorrhagic especially, which will be relatively high density compared to the urine in the blood, for example, or the bile in the gallbladder. So hemorrhagic ascites is a bad sign. Um, and then obviously we want to know whether we've got bilobe or any lobe disease, because this has implication to potentially curative therapy, such as a resection, and uh, if there's smaller satellites on the other side or the future uh, liver remnant, if the patient was to have a hepatectomy, obviously it makes resective surgery uh, not possible. We would also want to ascertain, uh, assuming that we offer this patient, for example, a left hepatectomy or an extended left hepatectomy, which uh, involves resecting segment two, three, and four we want to be sure that the volume of liver that stays behind is adequate to sustain life and liver function. So we often do volumetry of the liver to determine that. Uh, this patient was, was just by virtue of the size um, and maybe the comorbidities that uh, Bilal will go into was not a surgical candidate. Um, so we have a large mass lobulated is a patient who has got viral hepatitis, I gather, Bilal. Correct? I'm not 100% certain. Uh, it isn't noted in the notes that I have in sure. front of me. Sure, right. And uh, although the, the liver is, uh, we can see the margin here, it's not a straight, sharp margin. Looks uh, slightly irregular. So we worry, always worry about whether there's some fibrosis in that liver. Uh, good thing is, I uh, don't think we've got other indirect signs of portal hypertension. There's no ascites, <clears throat> and the spleen is not huge. I mean, it might be borderline. The spleen is not enlarged. So there's a slight irregularity of the liver. There might well be at least some fibrosis in that liver. And when they get this big, often it's difficult on imaging to uh, differentiate a cholangiocarcinoma, mass forming cholangiocarcinoma, and or an HCC, uh, from an HCC. And often we get the combo anyway in these large ones. So HCC versus cholangio, when it gets this big, can be uh, a problem to, to differentiate. But I think with the background, I, th I thought there was uh, a uh, well confirmed uh, uh, hepatitis, we would have gone for HCC first. And what you see here is a little uh, uh, radio opacity, which we is attached to uh, thrombogenic plugs that we put in after for a biopsy. You can imagine, there's a lot of tumor vascularity, like I showed you on the arteriophasia. When you do a pectinous biopsy, there's a very high risk of bleeding. So when we do these biopsies, we plug the tract with these uh, gel foam plugs, uh, some of which you can still see here. Uh, they look like air. And the front one always has this uh, radio patch marker. So you know exactly where you've biopsied. So that this is what is explaining this. And uh, the reason the biopsy was done was because there was a flat AFP and these features here, like I said, are not classical HCC, as in arterialization with obvious venous washout. And I think the histology is what uh, Martin would talk to us about. Thanks. Charles, if I can come back to you just in terms of uh, uh, the subsequent procedure, um, maybe 
uh, right. if you've got uh, some images of that. But then uh, over uh, to you, Prof. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bilal. Thanks, Charles. A wonderful demonstration, Charles. Could I could I ask you, please? You talked, um, uh, and you know, you mentioned the the uh, the Venus uh, washout. Or, um, is that is is the washout in comparison to the Venus phase and the rest of the liver? In other words, you're seeing the Venus phase and the rest of the liver, but not in the tumor. Uh, partly that, actually, mostly that, because um, the importance here is that. Uh, Hepatic cellular carcinoma predominantly gets the supply from the hepatic artery. Right. When we look at liver, normal liver parenchyma, 70% of its inflow is portal venous. Right. So there's going to be that differential in, 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 in what's I mean, As we flood the liver with portal venous flow, it becomes brighter. The arterial inflow, which was quite predominant earlier on uh, in the tumor because of its hypertrophy uh, uh, of the vessels. Yeah, so it will be a differential appearance because now the portal venous inflow into the rest of the liver uh, makes it brighter than the liver, which was originally white from the arterial flow. So it's, it's, it's a comparative appearance due to the. Yeah, so, 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 in fact, it's because of the accentuation of the portal system. Correct. Uh, into, the, into the normal liver. Because into the normal liver. Correct. And the fact that the tumor. In fact, as you said, has an arterial supply rather than a venous supply. Correct. So, right, I'm with you. So, in fact, uh, yes. Okay, so that explains it then. And then, consequently, you don't get the uh, the, the lighting up in the venous phase. Uh, that, correct, correct. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay, that explains it nicely. All right. All right. Um, shall I go ahead with histology? Yes, please. All right, so uh, I'll share my screen. So hopefully everybody can see the um, see the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Great. So what we've got is so uh, we've got multiple portions of of tissue here, and um, they are entirely neoplastic. It's all tumor with a bit of fibrin and uh, blood clot here. So that's uh, that's fibrin here, probably from tumor necrosis, I would think. <clears throat> what I'd like to do though is just go down on it. On um, doesn't really matter where we go down, but you can see here that uh, the first thing is that the architecture has been replaced, and in fact. Um, if we look at the low power, um, you can't really pick up any portal tracts or central veins. There are a lot of venous structures here. This sort of thing there. Throughout the biopsy, very similar appearance. And you can see that the normal architecture is of the liver is, just does not exist. And instead what we have is we've got these uh, these large cells with cleared cytoplasm. You see that well demonstrated here. Okay, large, almost look like fat cells. Some people may also say they look a bit like vegetable cells as well which you sometimes get, obviously, with things such as inborn errors of metabolism, but you haven't got the normal architecture. You've also got this tremendous variation in size. And then alternating with the clear cells, you also have cells that have uh, more Yes, cynophilic cytoplasm, such as these. And these cells, I think you can see, resemble hepatocytes. So you've got this, um, uh, this two cell population, uh, which is predominantly clear cell in type, but then you've also got this uh, smattering of cells with more eosinophilic cytoplasm. Um, the nuclear pleomorphism is, is mild to moderate. And you can see this tremendous variation in size. The other area, and this is mostly just before I move on, 
there's another focus of, of uh, eosinophilic cells. But just notice how this has got a sheet-like growth pattern. When you're faced with that sort of picture, it can be quite difficult, in fact, to decide um, what, the, what the primary tumor is, indeed, if it is a primary tumor, because there are a number of clear cell tumors that we also have to consider. And probably the most important one that, uh, that people, well, two that you need to think about. <clears throat> the first is, is metastatic renal cell carcinoma. <clears throat> and uh, the second, of course, is clear cell melanoma. Um, <clears throat> so one always has a histopathologist needs to think about uh, those uh, as, as possible differentials. In this part of the biopsy, though, you can see that there's a slightly different growth pattern. And this is a macrotrabecular growth pattern. And this pattern here is pretty characteristic of a paracellular carcinoma. And uh, it would be a macrotrabecular uh, picture. You can see that we've got cells with clear cytoplasm, and we've also got cells with more eosinophilic cytoplasm. So, uh, yeah, fairly typical of, of uh, a paracellular carcinoma. But uh, the tumors don't always read the textbooks, as we know. And one of the most useful stains from a histopathologist's point of view is the reticulum. And it's, it's quite disheartening, in fact, concerning when the reticulum stain doesn't <coughs> play ball with the paracellular carcinoma. And uh, in this particular instance, it did. And if we look at this area here, we can see that the reticulum framework is completely gone. There's very little in the way of reticulum, and what reticulum there is is fragmented. So this is very this is useful uh, because this helps separate out uh, tumors such as renal cell carcinomas and other clear cell tumors, um, and is characteristic, in fact, of a paracellular carcinoma. And in the old days. That's how we diagnosed hepatocellular carcinoma based on the H and E morphology uh, and the absence of reticulum. And uh, this is a pretty characteristic appearance of hepatocellular carcinoma. Today, we also have immunohistochemistry markers and uh, immunohistochemistry, as you've heard me say often, uh, should be used as a, as a supportive agent in the diagnosis, not to be used as a primary diagnostic tool. So this is the uh, I mean, uh, the antibody for um, hepatocyte antigen 1 or HEP, HEP R1, which is strongly positive. And uh, this is this we do. It's not a great antibody. And the reason why it's not a great antibody is because it can be positive in other tumors as well. For example, adenocarcinoma of the stomach is often HEP R1 positive. So this is positive in this particular instance, strongly positive in the tumor cells. And then if we look at the next one, which is glutamine synthetase, which is a good marker for paracellular carcinoma, but is also present in benign tumors as well. Got to find it again. And here you can see that the antibody is positive as well. You've got uh, good going cytoplasmic staining. You can see the nucleus in the center, for example, of these cells. So fairly characteristic for um, hepatocellular carcinoma. So for example, that sort of thing there, this is, I think, infiltrating into the tumor, uh, sorry, into the capsule. And uh, here you can see the positivity of the cytoplasm. And then the last one, I said the tumors don't always read the books. And this is an example of that. And this is uh, the antibody for glycan 3 which is a, 
uh, which is a good marker for hepatocellular carcinoma. Unfortunately, it's not uh, the, the um, sensitivity is not that high. Um, and it's not so you, you don't find it in all HCCs. I think it's about seventy percent, if I remember correctly. So there's a fair number of um, of HCCs that are negative with this particular antibody, and this is uh, one of those cases. I'm not sure about this uh, staining here. Um, looks to be sort of endothelial. I, I, I certainly interpreted this as, as being negative. So a nice example then of a clear cell hepatocellular carcinoma, and I think it uh, ticks all the boxes uh, from, uh, from that point of view. Um, got good radiological evidence. I, mean, I didn't do an alpha feed of protein that was negative. So the, the fact that the alpha feed of protein is low, you're unlikely to see it in the in the tumor cells. That's it. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, Charles, could you maybe just show one or two images of the embolization procedure that was performed um, subsequently? Oh, you've already got them. I was going to say we've got two questions for Prof Hale. You, do you want to maybe have a look at the questions on the chat? Um, Dr. Nkandala has asked uh, two separate questions on, on the two cases uh, that we can get to after we have a look at the images from the embolization. Charles, over to you. All right. Thanks, Bilal. All right. So if we go to the Barcelona Clinic um, staging and guidelines on, on management, um, this patient has got a tumor, which is, we said it was irresectable, outside transplant criteria, and is too in reasonable, uh, with the reasonable performance function and status. And I think uh, reasonably compensated uh, liver function, right? Correct, Bila? Yeah. Yeah. So what options do we have? Can we offer such patients for treatment for HCC? So this will be in the stage B on the BCLC, uh, where uh, transarterial options are the um, treatment of choice. I mean, traditionally, uh, transarterial chemoembolization was the uh, treatment and uh, has the longest experience and indeed was what uh, the Barcelona Clinic uh, group investigated over years. So we've got, we've since uh, got uh, transarterial radioembolization, which is still in its infancy relative to taste. I mean, we're talking more than 10 years, but still not as long as days. And we're still building evidence on that. In fact, I think the Barcelona Clinic staging um, was revised, was it last year or early this year? Where early this year. Early this year. Radio embolization is now coming on board as to yes. where we apply it. Um, in clinical practice, radio embolization was being applied across all stages. Basically, with Charles, no I've got the algorithm up on my screen. If okay, uh, you, can, you want I, me I to, can, I can share yeah. here. Yeah, let's put that up. Um, share okay. screen. I think it's important. There you go. There we are. Can you all see that? Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So as you can see here, I mean, this gentleman has got a massive tumor, which is well beyond what we can offer with uh, the curative. Sorry, do you want to minimize that? You had it nicely. Okay, maybe move it around a bit. There we go. There we go. Right. There go. Right. To the to the left of this um, template are the curative options, and uh, right extreme is the patients who are basically uh, on for for basic uh, care, supportive care. We are terminal, right? And in the uh, majority of patients that we see will be late. I mean, uh, I think less than 15% of what we see in clinical practice is resectable or transplantable. So we're going to catch it in this um, stage B or C. And transarterial chemoembolization is need the, the um, recommended treatment uh, for, for, for stage B disease. And um, systemic therapies have uh, been developed quite a bit. I mean, there's lots of immunotherapies on board now, 
things things I didn't learn at medical school and uh, half, of, mm. half of which I, I can't pronounce. But uh, there's impressive uh, results with uh, the newer agents. So HCC is no longer, okay, I suppose it's still a lethal disease, but I think we, at least we've got options now. So in this patient, we chose to offer transarterial chemoembolization, partly because it's a tenth of the price of radioembolization and easily accessible. We tend to get more side effects with taste compared to radioembolization, and but uh, it's something that's medically manageable. There is a few trials I think still on the go where there's combinations of transarterial options with these immunotherapies. And I don't think we have got um, strongly positive study just yet. But it's uh, intuitively, you'd imagine we're going to get uh, more than additive value by combining these um, uh, immune check inhibitors with transarterial therapies. So in this mm -hmm. patient, we offered transarterial chemobilization. So I uh, maybe can unshare and then I'll move on to my slides. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. All right, so we opted to do a transarterial option, which is transarterial chemobilization. In essence, what you're trying to do there is to get into the tumor vessels, supplying the tumor, and sparing the arterial vessels into the normal liver. And with chemoembolization, you then flood the tumor with um, chemotherapy, which is tagged to some uh, carrier. And the carriers are into two big groups. One is a liquid carrier, which is a piedal, which has been around for time immemorial. It's a long, I um, mean, we have used it for a long time. And the other one is uh, relatively new, newly developed agents, uh, drug eluding beads, which are beads which you can tag with chemotherapy. And then you use them as an embolic agent and also as a delivery agent of the chemotherapy. So you get into the, uh, into the tumor vascularity, uh, flood it with this, um, either the liquid or the uh, beads. And at the same time, you are also making the tumor ischemic by cutting the blood flow. And our access is to get to the hepatic artery. In this particular patient, you can see that the catheter is coursing from cranial to caudal. So the access here was from the radio artery, which is what we're tending to do now, uh, I think. 80% of our arterial access is now radial. It's less traumatic, patient mobilizes quicker with less morbidity with it. Conventionally, we used to use femoral access. So there you will see the catheter coming from caudal to cranial. And then using a variety of coaxial systems, we can get deeper into the tumor. So as the vessels get smaller, they might not be able to take your original access four French or five French catheter. Through this, you can then put in a three French Microcatheter, and that can go quite a bit. <laughs> we can go quite distal and be super selective to the individual vessels. So this is the access and the super selection into the um, into the vessel into the tumor there. And I'll just show a picture of Lepardo is very hyperdense, so it shows off as this uh, dark um, black smidges that you're seeing. And you can imagine from the big muscle that we saw that we're getting all these layering in these big vessels and within the tumor. And some of those satellites, which are high up as well, are being flooded by this, what we call a chemo emulsion, because this liquid agent is oily. So we mix it with the uh, aqueous um, chemo agent, which is doxorubicin. That's the agent of choice and the most widely used across the world. So you make an emulsion of this uh, lepidol, which is very hyperdense, with this chemo agent, in a uh, small volume of chemo agent. We use up to 150 milligrams of uh, doxorubicin per session, uh, knowing that here we are locally de delivering it and it's not a systemic application. So it will not have as many side effects as systemically infused uh, chemo agent. So we, we, uh, from uh, this uh, just shows the steps um, uh, through which of we, we, we then did the, uh, the chemoembolization. At the end, you then do an angiogram at the end to make sure that the inflow is indeed completely obliterated. Okay, that's me there. 
Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, uh, uh, would you like to just uh, answer the two questions that uh, were posed on the chat? Yeah, sure, Bilal. So, uh, have you seen you see them? The, can you see the screen? Yeah. So, so the yes. first question was how, uh, what, do, what do I mean by exploding crypts? And uh, I've just found this, uh, this uh, field here, uh, which is a cross section of a crypt. And I think it, it shows it fairly well. Can, can you see my pointer here? Yes. So um, if we imagine, uh, uh, if this was a normal crypt, you would have a small, at least, sorry, you'd have a smooth outline. So the outline of the crypt would be like this, but it would be all the way around. And in fact, you haven't got that in this particular situation. So what we've got here is that we've got this large vacuolated cell. And in fact, it's it's a bit like um, it's it's a bit like a blowout on a tire, really. You know, when you have a a very thin prolapsing uh, uh, tire wall, you see this bulge on the edge of the tire, and uh, that's what this is. So this is an exploding crypt, and uh, it's actually, I suppose, to use the word crypt is is probably the wrong word. What we should probably call them are exploding cells, because that's indeed what's happening. You've got the cell itself, the epithelial cell that is being destroyed uh, by the graft versus host reaction. So that's happening there, that's happening there, that's happening there. So you can see we've got this sort of blowout appearance uh, to the crypt. Uh, has that, uh, does that uh, help answer the, the question? I hope so. Um, do you want to move on to the second so question? The, so sec that's the first question. And then the second question, uh, was how do we differentiate, and, and in fact, I should have shown you this, how do we just separate uh, these cells out from fat cells? Well, the first is that um, obviously the location, you shouldn't have uh, fat in the, in the liver, uh, but uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly it's a good question. And um, so what we've got here, and this also adds to the sort of complexity of diagnosing clear cell tumors, <clears throat> because the clear cell appearance comes about uh, because of uh, abundant glycogen, excuse me, or um, or glucose uh, in the uh, in the cells, and uh, this is a past stain, and you can see that uh, we've got this uh, abundant um, material, probably not coming up as eosinophilic as it should, uh, but you can see this abundant material on the uh, on the past stain, which is staining up the glycogen in the cells. And then when we do the past diastase, you can see that the cells become clear again. So what's happened is that the diastase has, has dissolved the glycogen, but consequently it is negative. So you wouldn't expect fat cells to contain uh, glycogen. That's how we separate them out. Great. I hope that answers the question. Um, it is, what, two, three minutes past uh, uh, half past five. Uh, so, um, uh, great. Uh, Dr. Nkandala is happy with the answers. So, thank you uh, to that, um, to our two presenters, uh, Prof. Martin Hale and Dr. Charles Sinika. Um, that was, that was, that was uh, fantastic, absolutely riveting. And for those of you with an HCC interest, um, next week's session uh, is on, 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 on more HCC for the last meeting of the year. Um, I want to thank, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, looks like it is uh, gonna be a, a really great uh, lecture. Um, I've been involved with Dr. Sobnach's um uh some of his research and it is truly fascinating picking up novel um uh genomics from the african hcc cohort um i'd like to thank the university of new mexico and echo uh india uh, india teams please fill out the uh, feedback form if you have any, any anything to report the recordings remember are still available on the gastro foundation website course, thanks to Chris Cassinides and the Gastro Foundation, um, uh, who, who corrals in the various sponsors to make this happen. Um, so yeah, 
I'd like to thank everybody. Chris, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, and, and, and Bilal, this is our last PATH session for the year, and I really want to take this opportunity of thanking you and particularly, and also Martin for your dedication, and really you're a born teacher, and uh, it's been a, a very successful uh, year, I think. It's raised the awareness of PATH, and Charles, very nice to have you on board, and I hope that next year we can entice you into uh, visiting us more often and perhaps give, de devoting uh, a rad radiological sessions, uh, which you could perhaps take control of but that's another story but really it's a, it's really to thank you guys for being there every month and i know we've abused you at times but i tell you these sessions are really magnificent and uh, we're very grateful from the foundation and from gasa thank you very much great pleasure chris i've enjoyed them and i learned a lot as well so it's two ways it's bi-directional yeah same yeah thank you great thank you everyone have a good evening. Um, for those that are able, don't forget the liver interest group meeting happening on the 4th of November uh, in, in Cape Town. Chris, do we have an December. online streaming? December, uh, December. Yes, yes, it, it's it's a hybrid meeting. Yeah, so it, it, it'll be, uh, there's a virtual presence and uh, face presence in Cape Town. So please, uh, please log on, log on if, even if you can't make it to Cape Town. Uh, that program also looks great. Thank you. Thanks, good everyone. evening. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.